Hello class. Today we'll be talking about Chapter 6, The Network Layer. At the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain how network layer protocols and services support communications across data networks, explain how routers enable end-to-end -end connectivity in a small to medium-sized business network, determine the appropriate device to route traffic in a small to medium-sized business network, and configure a router with basic configurations. Kind of an exciting chapter because we get to get our hands in on some great labs and really start to uh, get the router working for us within our network. We've been working uh, up to this point primarily with the switch. Okay, there's many diagrams out there of the OSI model and this is another diagram of those seven layers of the OSI model. The reason they've been color-coded is to uh, emphasize the encapsulation. Notice that the top three layers deal with data and then it is segmented at the transport layer, packetized at the network layer, framed at the data link layer, and then sent out on the wire at the physical layer. We typically call the bottom three layers the media layers and the top four layers the host layers because the top layers tend to support host applications. The bottom layers tend to deal with the transport of our bits in and out of the network cable. So when you have the network layer, it's really in reality sending your bits down to layer two. It receives the bits as they're generated by the application. They go down through the layers from seven to six to five to four to three to two to one then out the door, across the network, and then back up the layers on the receiving end. However, we also have what we call a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, meaning that layer three thinks about communication in terms of talking to layer three on the other side. For instance, when I fill out who it's from and who it's to, if I was at layer three, I would be filling who it's to as layer three on the receiving end. I wouldn't be thinking about layer two or layer one. Similar to when we have a telephone conversation as human beings, if I were to call you on the phone, I would be thinking about your voice and talking to you. I wouldn't be thinking about the microphones and speakers and wires and all of the uh, lower level infrastructure involved in getting my voice to you and your voice to me. So the network layer has an implied peer-to-peer -peer relationship with the same layer on the receiving end. Even though there is no communication directly across, and I'm just going to draw that here. It has an implied peer-to-peer -peer connection. The network layer deals with end-to-end -end transport. So the packet, which is the encapsulation of the network layer, um, has IP addressing, which is global or end-to-end, -end, meaning the definitive source and destination of the communication. So it addresses all the way across the world, all the way across the multiple networks it would traverse, uh, who it is uh, originating from, and who it is ultimately destined for. Network layer has an encapsulation called the packet. Network layer deals with routing, which is the concept of finding a best path through a network that may have multiple paths and also paths that change over time. So the network might have new paths and lose old paths, much like a road system. It's one job of the network layer to determine what the best path through the network is. Also, on the receiving end, you have to de-encapsulate. So on the sending end, you encapsulate, meaning put the data, in this case the segment into a packet and when it is received you must decapsulate the packet and hand the segment off to layer 4. The common network layer protocols we see today would be IPv4 and IPv6. Those who've taken our Intec 103 class have studied these two protocols and will be using them in an application based way in our lab activities. As you may know, the world is switching slowly from IPv4 to IPv6. That switch is going to be accelerating in the very near future as we've officially run out of IPv4 addressing. Some other network protocols that have existed in the past include Novell's IPX, AppleTalk, and DECnet. 
characteristics of IP. So if we think about IP in terms of an IP packet, it is connectionless. So IP doesn't call up the other side. Uh, when you send a letter through the post, you fill out who it's to, you fill out who it's from, and there's no real direct connection to the other end. There's no communication, there's no check to see if it got there. So it is connectionless. There is no way to, to verify it arrived. At, at layer three, at the network layer, we have that capability at layer four. So don't worry, the capability exists um, and we don't need to duplicate those capabilities at each layer because it's a stacked model. So at layer three, it's just connectionless, it's best effort, and it's media independent. Again, this is just like the post office. Media independent means it could travel on copper, fiber, wireless. The packet will travel across any kind of media. Just like your envelope, if you fill out an envelope and lick and put a stamp on that thing, it is connectionless. The sender has no way to let the receiver know the letter is coming. It's best effort, so it's unreliable. It's possible that it could get lost in transport. There's no guarantee of delivery, in other words. We have a high, um, statistically high probability it will arrive because it's fairly, um, fairly good at doing that, but it is best effort. There is no mechanism by which it's guaranteed to arrive. And uh, as I say, it's media independent. So your letter could be on a boat, a plane, an automobile, a train. You don't really know or care. And they provide that example in terms of the letter system being a connectionless and unreliable and media independent method of delivering a message. So if we talk about best effort, some packets may get lost in route. That's what best effort means. We make a, make a best effort attempt to get it there. We try our best. And it may, may or may not get through. Media independent, here's different media, copper, fiber optic, and wireless. Here's a look at the encapsulation. So unlike the frame that we studied last chapter, the frame has a trailer, the packet and all other encapsulations only have a header. So there's no trailer. So they're not really encapsulating or wrapping the data. They're really just adding some information in front of the data. So the segmentation at layer four would have added a segment to the data. We are now gonna add an IP header in front of the segment header in front of the data. This is a look at what an IPv4 header would look like. You can see there's a lot of fields here. Some of them have been highlighted. Time to live is, is an important field. This uh, prevents packets from trolling around the internet forever and ever. A time to live tracks how many routers the packet passes through and it's a decrement timer. So it starts at 255 and it goes down to zero. And once the timer hits zero, the packet is discarded as undeliverable. This prevents endless loops on the internet. And of course, a source and destination address as required to be able to deliver the message globally. Okay, you can use your Wireshark software and you can take a look at real packets traveling across the wire and pick them out and you can take a look at the fields in the packet. Those same fields we just looked at in the artist drawing, you can see in reality here the time to live. This one has a time to live of 128. The protocol is identified as ICMP. That's Internet Control Message Protocol. That means this is probably a ping. And it has the source and destination IP addresses. And you'll see the length field and lots of different fields, the version field, all of those fields you can match up to real output and you have a lab where you'll do this. It's important to um, know that IPv4 is running out. Unfortunately, students today have to learn IPv4 because even though we're going to abandon it, it's gonna be around probably for the next 10 years. So we don't wanna put your careers on hold that long. It's important to have a good understanding of IPv4, plus businesses are really gonna look for those employees 
those leaders of their network that can move them from IPv4 to IPv6. So you've got a heavier burden than I had when I was learning this back in the day where I only had to learn IPv4. Although I did learn DECnet and some of the other protocols that are worthless today, you will be learning IPv4 and IPv6. So why? Because IPv4 is simply running out of addresses. It's not a long enough number to create enough number iterations to satisfy the growing networks of the world. And there are some problems with it routing wise. The IPv4 header has a lot of fields and that takes a lot of CPU effort to process all those fields. The IPv6 header actually has far fewer fields in the header. So there are less pieces of information in an IPv6 header. Also, we've had to add something called NAT, Network Address Translation, that was an attempt to extend the life of IPv4, but at the same time, it broke into in connectivity. So things like uh, real-time video, real-time voice, a lot of our streaming, a lot of things are broken and don't work as effectively as they could. They have more latency and more overhead to their operation because uh, of the running out of IPv4 addresses. So we moved to IPv6, a whole new number. It's just a longer number. It's still a binary number. Instead of 32 bits, it's 128 bits. And it provides a much larger address space to meet the growing needs of our network. It has a um, header that is less fields. It's a longer header, but it has less fields in it. And so it has improved packet handling. It requires less CPU. It moves faster through a router. We've eliminated the need for NAT, which was a mechanism that broke into in connectivity. So we get back our end in connectivity. And IPv6 has integrated security and mobility features. And this is just a look here comparing uh, the number of IPv4 addresses to the number of IPv6 addresses. Trust me, there are a lot. An analogy that I found was a mathematician online said if you took all the IPv4 addresses as a geometric shape of an iPod, it would compare to all the IPv6 addresses having the geometric shape of the Earth. So that as a size comparison, if you were holding all the IPv4 addresses and they were the size of an iPod, the comparable size, giving an address a physical shape, which it does not have, but the mathematician did this for comparison, you could say that the Earth, the size of the Earth is um, a comparable to that. So it's incredibly many, many, many times larger. Here's a look at both the headers. Notice I said the IPv6 header is longer. It's physically more bits in length. So there are more bits in the header, but there are fewer fields. So if you were thinking of this as a form, it's a longer form, but it has fewer things to fill in. The fewer the fields, the faster a CPU can process the header. And so we have created a header with IPv6 that can be routed quicker. Again, here's a look at the packet header. And you can see that and will when you do the labs for this chapter, the IPv6 packet can be looked at through Wireshark and you can see those fields. This is a look at a host routing table. Every device, your cell phone, your printer, your PC, they all have a routing table. It tells them how and where to send their packets. And so this is a, a PC. And if we type route print, we're going to get a printout of the routing table. And you can see the destinations listed on the left and over to the right. It tells you what interface on this PC would be used to reach those destinations. So routing is an inherent or necessary part of any device's participation in a network especially if it's going to have more than one interface. It has to make a choice of which one is the preferred way to use. Like a laptop or a cell phone that may have wireless and wired and Bluetooth and a number of different network, maybe cellular, a number of different ways to get to the networks. Here is packet forwarding decisions. This router has to make a decision about how to forward the packet. 
A default gateway is your router. It's your doorway out of your part of the network. So every device in a network must know where its default gateway is, otherwise it would be limited to communicating only within its local network segment. If you have the wrong gateway or you don't have a gateway on a device, it can't reach the internet, for instance, and it can't reach any devices that are beyond a router outside the door. It would be like in a room, if you were sitting in a room and you didn't know where the door was to get out of the room, you couldn't find the door, so to speak, you would be limited to accessing only the resources available to you within that room. This command, netstat-r, is identical to the command you saw earlier that said route print. They both show you the same host routing table. Not quite sure why um, Windows provides two commands that show the same output, but they do. Okay, and this is a IPv6 routing table. If you've configured IPv6 on your P Windows PC, this is what you would likely see. I hope you can notice this table's actually got shorter length IP addresses. One misnomer is that IPv6 is these long, ugly addresses because IPv6 is 128 bits and IPv4 is 32, you would expect to see a much longer number in this. Let me flip back and show you. Look how long those numbers are and how short most IPv6 numbers are. There are a few exceptions in this table. I see some very long ones, but most of the IPv6 addresses you will encounter will actually be shorter than their IPv4 equivalents. Router packet forwarding decisions. So a router connected to multiple destinations can make decisions about how to route the traffic. In this particular network topology, the router can make only one decision. Notice it has no redundant or multiple paths. There's only a single path the router can take to any one destination. So there's not going to be a lot of thinking going on. The router has only got to track a single path to a single destination. So each destination only has a single path. There are topologies where routers, say if we had added a second link between router 1 and 2, or add a third router and have them all connected in a triangle, the routers would have choices. Uh, more than one path they could take to get to any destination. That really is where routers shine, is when they have multiple paths to the same destination. This would be a look at that router's routing table. And now that you've looked at a host routing table, you would have a better chance of understanding what the router is doing. Each row on this table is a route to a destination. Some of those destinations are directly connected. That's the C. If you look at a row that starts with a C or an L, those are directly connected local destinations. And there's always a C and an L for each directly connected. Uh, one is the router's outgoing port, that's the L, and the C is the um, network ID for that locally connected network. And you'll get used to that as you do the lab on this. Okay, this is just looking at the different parts over the C and the L are identifying how the router learned about those networks. In this case, they're directly connected. Sometimes it learned about them from another router, and then they would have a different indicator there, like a D or an O or an R. And there's always a key um, of the symbols. Let me go back a slide. You'll see the key at the top here that helps you know what the symbols are. So for instance, we see some Ds in this table. If we look under the codes in the key, we can see that the D means it was learned through the EIGRP protocol. That means that router two has shared that information with router one. Part B of the output for each row is the destination. That defines the IP destination. So that's the network ID for that network. And then C is which port connects to that network. 
So that's how you read it. Now here's some more letters and you can look at even more information. This is the total amount of information you see in a router routing table. There's a lot here. So we already covered some of these. If you look at, at the C in this uh, diagram, it identifies the trustworthiness of the information. So if you had two paths to the same destination, you would take the one with the lower number here. A lower number would be it's more trustworthy. Higher numbers are less trustworthy. So for instance, a 90 is more trustworthy than a 120. Then if you look at the um, D at the blue area, that long number is called a cost metric and lower again is better. Think of it like dollars and cents. If I had the same, same administrative distance, so if I had two paths to the destination that were the same, uh, they both had a 90, I would look for the one with the lowest cost. And then again, the E identifies where you're going. That's the next hop, that's the next router or the next device you're headed to in your journey to get there. And then F is going to identify how long it's been since this route was added to the routing table. So um, that helps the router know when it needs to refresh or recheck a route if it's been in the table a long time. Also for you as an admin, if you see a route that has not been in the table very long, it means that network has recently or that path to the network has recently come, become available. And you'll kind of have to learn to read through these so that you can pick that information. Here's an example highlighted in yellow showing two routes with the same administrative distance. Notice the trustworthiness is 90 on both of those. But in this case, they go to two different destinations. Like I said, and it's almost unfortunate, Cisco has chosen for this PowerPoint to um, put a topology that has no redundant links. So you have absolutely only one and one path to get anywhere. There's no, never a choice. You're never gonna see the same network listed twice, in other words, in this topology, but it is not typical. Normally, you would design networks with multiple paths to the same destination. Now, if we pop the hood on the router, if we take the little screws out and take the dust cover off, what we'll see is what looks like a motherboard. This is the main or motherboard of the router, and it is very similar to a PC motherboard. In fact, a router is a PC. It's just a specialized PC. So a router and a PC are considered like devices. And you would find on this board ports and connectors. You see those uh, along the, the top edge there. And then we have a CPU. We're going to have um, a hard drive storage, which is going to be flash based. So you're going to have a flash. You're also going to have a slot for RAM. Uh, I can see the RAM slot down near the bottom and there's no RAM in it. But there could be some RAM and it looks like there is soldered to the motherboard. So sometimes some of the RAM is pre-installed and permanently affixed to the motherboard and then the slot is to add additional RAM if you want to upgrade. You'll notice the flash, uh, which is a um, card sitting over on the far left lower corner, that flash would also be removable and replaceable with a higher powered uh, storage if you wanted to add more storage to the device. So that's essentially what you get. It's very much like a PC. You wouldn't have a GPU, so you wouldn't have a graphics card. Uh, you wouldn't have a sound card. You wouldn't have a lot of the extra wiring, so you won't see um, this board is packed with um, components as a PC. This is what a router looks like uh, physically. And like I said, it is a computer. It's a specialized computer, just like a toaster is an oven. Yeah, a toaster is, you know, technically an oven. It's a specialized oven. A toaster is an oven that toasts bread, right? You could bake bread in the oven and get a similar effect, but a toaster does it much better. A router is that way to a PC. A PC can do anything. I could put software on a PC. In fact, the Windows operating system allows you to turn your PC into a router. It just would be slower at doing the job, less efficient, much like toasting toast in an oven. So a router is um, analogous to a toaster in that it's a very specialty device for a special purpose. Here's a look at the CPU. It has a heat sink there, that black aluminum 
fan grid is going to help heat rise off of the CPU and dissipate into the air. Many routers uh, don't have a fan on the CPU. You see those on PCs. Uh, the router simply does not need the fan because the CPU generates far less heat. It's much smaller and more specialized because it doesn't have to do all the various tasks that a PC does. So it doesn't use the same CPU as a PC. It's a specialty CPU just for routing. But a router is RAM. It has ROM, it has MD RAM, and flash. Those are the primary storage areas of the router. RAM is similar to a PC. It's your running operating system. When you type your commands, that's where they're at. That's where all of your um, tables and uh, logs and all of that information are stored and RAM disappears, the contents disappear from RAM every time you power off the device. ROM is a permanent area of storage that stores um, some limited uh, instructions. It's similar to um, what you would call POST or BIOS in a PC. And then NVRAM is battery-backed RAM that stands for non-volatile RAM and it's today it's just flash. And it used to be RAM with a battery glued to it, but today it is flash that uh, stores our commands. When we type our commands and save them, they get saved here. And then the flash um, is similar to an SSD, a solid state drive in a PC, which is replacing hard drives. Flash in a router is the hard drive and it's where the operating system is stored, as well as any other files that you may want to store there. Here's another look at another router. Over on the uh, left is a power supply and a fan. And you're going to have a lab where you get to identify these components. Then exterior, you have to identify the different slots and ports. This router is similar to the ones we have in our lab. Notice they have replaceable flash cards. This flash is not internal. I don't have to take the dust cover off. I can take that little plate off and it's compact flash similar to what's used in a digital camera and you can put in new um, new flat higher power flash. You also have some expansion slots that you can add additional ports to the router if you want to add an extra ethernet port or a um, you know cable modem or a DSL port or any a pretty much any kind of port that you may need. Cisco sells uh, little expansion cards that fit those slots. Then we have the auxiliary and the console ports um, the auxiliary port is identical to a console port, but designed to connect a modem to, not for the internet, but a modem for you to dial into from a remote location. We're not going to cover that in this class. In this class, we'll be using the console port, which is the same thing. It does the same thing. It gives you the ability to type commands into the router. Notice there's two console ports. You're only allowed to use one of them. You have to pick. You can use the RJ45 one that goes to a DB9 serial connector on the back of your PC, or you could use the newer Type B USB port, which connects right into the USB port on your computer. Then we have some Ethernet ports, and the USB ports are for those flash thumb drives that you can put in there, and uh, it's a quick, easy way to put a backup copy of your config or um, uh, you know, move files on and off of the router, and that's what those ports are really there for. There's a card inserted here. Cisco IOS. So Cisco's operating system is specific to a router. And so when a router boots up, it's going to look for the operating system or Cisco IOS. So the router, when it boots up, goes through what's called POST, power on self-test. And then it would load a bootloader which from ROM. And a bootloader is a special program that is got one job, find an operating system. So it will start searching for your Cisco operating system. And when it finds it, it will load it into RAM. Once your operating system is in RAM, your operating system will take over from the bootloader and it will look for a configuration file. And it will likely find it in MVRAM and it will load that into RAM. Notice everything loads into and runs from RAM. 
it is stored in flash or in the RAM, but actually operates out of RAM. So RAM is our working memory where we have everything loaded that we're using on the device. So like I said, we start with post and then we go through a bootstrap and these come off of the ROM, the permanent uh, storage, and then the bootstrap finds the operating system, then the operating system finds the configuration and then we're off and running. So you'll want to get this sequence of steps of how a router boots. It's very similar to how a PC boots. If we type the show version command, we can see what version of operating system has been loaded. We also find a list of all the ports on the device, what model of device we have. Um, we even know where the file was loaded from, in this case out of flash. We can tell that the system was powered on 10 hours and nine minutes ago. So there's a lot of information in the show version command. It's a very helpful command um, to understand what's going on with our device. So when you configure your router, you're gonna plug a console cable into the console port, and then you're going to need some terminal emulation software on your PC, and you would type commands like you see here. Typically, we're gonna to look to do five things. We're going to wanna to set a host name, so we wanna change the router's name from router to something customized, in this case, R1. The next thing we're going to wanna to do is set up passwords on the interfaces. So we're going to set um, different passwords. In this case, we've set a password on the enable prompt and a password on the console and the uh, remote access ports. The next thing we're gonna to wanna to do, third thing, is set up a banner message. A banner message is a legal requirement in case someone tries to get in our device, we wanna tell them they're not supposed to. The, after that, we would want to set up um, at least one port. We want to put an IP address on a port so we have a basically a way to remotely get in the device. We may want to go ahead and set up more than one IP address so that we could have uh, the, the router get to work. And then we want to save our config as our fifth thing. So it's uh, this slide is leaving one thing off, which is just uh, you want to configure one or more of your interfaces with IP addresses. And they just moved it over here because it's longer. It didn't fit on the slide. But you want to do this before you save your config. You can save your config like you do in a Word document. You can save often and many times. So it's a good idea to save your config as you go. But you would definitely, after typing this, want to also save your config again. And then we, of course, verify that everything works by doing some of those ping commands to make sure that we can reach the uh, devices on the other ends of our cables and that verifies that our interfaces are up and working. If we're in the Windows PC, we have to give it an IP address and a mask and a gateway. And we've done this. And again, the default gateway is very important for the scenario on the right. The scenario on the left, PC1 communicating with PC2, you follow the red line there, the red arrow, uh, does not need the assistance of the router, so a default gateway is not necessary to facilitate that type of communication. But if PC1 wanted to reach PC3, as shown in the lower right diagram, it would need the assistance of the router, so PC1 would need a correct default gateway to identify the router's gig zero zero port because that would be the port in the same room or network segment as PC1. Switches also need a default gateway or you can't reach them from a remote location. So it's shown here on the slide, I would highly recommend you have in your notes how to set a default gateway on a switch. A switch we really only give a switch an IP address for remote administration so we can log in it remotely. Remember, a switch is working at layer two, and so it doesn't use IP addresses except to allow us to remotely connect to the switch. So if you don't have a default gateway, you would only be able to connect to the switch from PC one or two, which are local to the switch. That really handicaps your ability to remotely manage the device. And in the um, hands-on final exam for this course, you will be setting up a network that looks fairly similar to this topology and you will certainly need to set the IP default gateway on your switch. So in summary, we covered 
layer three of the OSI and the services it provides to the network. IP addressing, encapsulation, routing, and de-encapsulation. We also point out that the internet is largely still IPv4 and will be for a long time. We talked about the IPv4 packet and looked at its header, and then we looked at it in comparison with the IPv6 packet and header and saw how IPv6 has a more simplified header and the ability to work faster. In addition to hierarchical addressing, which is logical addressing that can be grouped, the network layer is also responsible for routing, maintaining routing tables, and making a best path decision. Hosts require a local routing table as well to ensure that packets go out the correct exit interface. The local default route is the route to the default gateway or router. The default gateway or router is the IP address of a router interface um, closest to or directly connected to that local network. The routing table of a router stores information about directly connected routes and all the remote networks in a table and has a comparison between them with things like administrative distance, which is trustworthiness, the cost metric, which is the cost of getting there, and uh, the exit interface, which is the port to uh, exit the device if you choose to take that path. Routing table entries can be configured manually or they can dynamically, which means automatically, learn the information via a routing protocol from their neighbor routers. Thank you for your time. Good luck with the test.